It's time for questions to the Executive Office, and we will start with listed questions. Before I call the member to ask the first question in response to, po um, in response to points of orders raised in recent weeks, may I remind members that in accordance with Speaker's ruling, supplementary questions should be related to the topic of the lead question, but it is for ministers to decide whether they will answer questions, not the Chair. Iram Sir, Stephen Agnew. I call Stephen Agnew. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number one, please. I will be aware that a meeting between us has now been arranged and I look forward to hearing his views on how alleged breaches of the Ministerial Code should be investigated. Supplementary for Stephen Agnew. I thank the Deputy First Minister for uh, agreeing to meet. I am sure he will be aware when the question was submitted that had not yet, yet happened. The Deputy First Minister may be aware that I originally proposed um, the, the extension of the powers of the uh, Standards Commissioner in the previous mandate, and um, unfortunately my proposal can, was can blocked by, by, by the DUP. Um, can I just ask, in the response that he gave to me the last time on this matter, was he speaking on behalf of himself and the, Deputy, or, and the First Minister? Well, I, th I think my answer today is quite clearly on behalf of myself and the First Minister, and uh, we have uh, agreed to meet. Uh, obviously, there have been previous discussions in the Assembly around extending the role of the uh, Commissioner, but uh, that didn't find favour with the Assembly. And of course, the Assembly does have the power, if uh, there is a complaint against a Minister, to gather up signatures from 30 people, which can then be brought to the Assembly and for the Assembly to decide in relation to what action needs to be taken. But uh, I mean, I think the important thing is that uh, I conceded during the course of the previous question time that this was an issue for the member and that uh, we were willing to discuss. So we've now agreed to have the meeting. Uh, if there are any others within the House who feel similarly as strongly as the member, we're, we're very willing to. Uh, include them in that meeting, if that's acceptable to the member. I call Mike Nesbitt for supplementary. Principal uh, Deputy Speaker, thank you. Um, does the First Minister, on the, the broad question of standards, does the, the Deputy First Minister think that um, the role <clears throat> of Speaker has been damaged by current revelations and indeed by his statement to the House earlier? Well, I, I don't think that that is uh, an appropriate question in the context of the question that has been asked by Stephen Agnew. Uh, I, I note that there is uh, an opportunity later on under topicals for a member of the Ulster Unionist Party to ask a question. If that person chooses to ask that question at the time, I will answer it. Sir Michaela Boyle. Uh, can I ask the Minister, uh, are you satisfied, Minister, that the current mechanisms relating to alleged breaches of the Ministerial Code of Conduct are fit for purpose for Morgan? Well, I, I think the Assembly, more importantly, has decided that they are fit for purpose. The, the First Minister and I are in agreement that the current mechanisms relating to how alleged breaches of the Ministerial Code are dealt with, uh, as provided for in the Northern Ireland Act 1998, are fit for purpose. Uh, they provide the appropriate level of safeguard in that where an allegation uh, is to be made that a minister had breached an element of the ministerial code. Such a, an allegation would be dealt with uh, appropriately, robustly and fairly. And as members will be aware, it is the Assembly rather than the First Minister and I which ultimately has the authority to adjudicate upon alleged breaches of the ministerial code. Section 30 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998 provides for a motion for a resolution of the Assembly that a minister or Junior Minister no longer enjoys its confidence uh, due to failure to observe the terms of the Ministerial Pledge of Office. This mechanism can be triggered with the support, as I said, of at least 30 members and can result in exclusion uh, of a Minister from office for a period of time, a reduction of their remuneration or censure in the Chamber. So uh, the current arrangements, I think, thus far have found favour with the Assembly, but absolutely open to a further discussion about that. Sir Pat Sheehan. I call Pat Sheehan. Question two. Uh, with your permission, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, Junior Minister Farron will answer this question. Grimagut, our department will soon commence a review of the current race relations order and other relevant legislation. 
We remain committed to achieving racial equality here and want our legislation to be a model for other jurisdictions. Our 10-year strategy sets out an ambitious but achievable, achievable programme to take this forward. Clearly this will be an extensive piece of work and it is important that we have legislation that is thorough enough to meet current and future needs. Pat Sheehan for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for that answer. And uh, could I take the opportunity to commend the Minister on the work that's being done with refugees? And could I ask her for an update on the 2016-17 crisis fund? I would to thank the member for his question um, and also for recognising the good work that is being done in terms of uh, Syrian refugees coming to relocate here. Uh, just last week, um, Junior Minister Ross and I met the UN High Commissioner for Refugees uh, and just today received a letter expressing his own gratitude and commending us on the work that is being done. Um, he was actually very touched by the experiences of refugees living here and wanted to pass on that message regarding the experience that they've had under our operation. Um, obviously, the Crisis Fund and the Minority Ethnic Development Fund are key delivery mechanisms of the racial equality strategy and the Red Cross is responsible for administering the £100,000 budget of the Crisis Fund. It's really there for vulnerable migrants, destitute refugees and asylum seekers and other vulnerable groups um, and it's there for people who are in a crisis situation uh, providing immediate and very precise help to take them out of a, a hole in terms of food, clothing, heat and electricity um, or short-term accommodation and it makes a real impact and I think Actually, the crisis fund has made such an impact and it is uh, such a success. Scotland and Wales are actually looking to relocate, to replicate the model in their own regions. Aram Sir, Richie McPhillips, call uh, Richie McPhillips for supplementary. Thank you, Madam De Deputy Principal Speaker, and thank the ministers for their answer so far. Can the minister outline why the executive office failed to send anyone to the from their department to respond to various international human rights treaty reporting bodies, one of which concerned racial equality? Uh, well, I know that the UN Committee on the um, Ending of Racial Discrimination has um, actually commended the racial equality strategy and our approach to several things. Um, I'm happy to write to the member with more information if he wants to get back with specifics. I call Danny Kennedy. Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, Junior Minister uh, uh, will be aware of, of criticisms from, the, from both the Northern Ireland Human Rights uh, Commission and the Equality Commission and others about the non participation. Uh, from the Northern Ireland Executive in, in respect of, of, of international reporting cycles. For example, uh, the, the International Co the Covenant question. on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Will the Junior Minister undertake to ensure full participation in future reporting cycles? Absolutely. Obviously, um, the rights and the entitlements that our ethnic minority communities have here are hugely important to us. Um, I, I've already said that the UN have actually commended us on our approach to refugees, so I see no reason that we wouldn't participate fully in upcoming uh, committees. I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Principal Speaker. Um, thank you very much to the Junior Minister so far for her, for her answers. Um, given that the Executive has not progressed any form of equality legislation since 2007, how can we have any confidence of progress during this term? Uh, I thank the Member for her question. Obviously, uh, one of the key actions identified under the racial equality strategy is a review of current race relations legislation. Um, obviously, legislation has to be a priority, um, and reviewing that legislation is actually a massive piece of work. But um, I think it's important that we get it right, and for me, that time that will be time well spent. Um, and we're very much hoping to see new racial equality legislation in place in the 2017-18 financial year. I call Joanne Bunting. Thank you. Question three, please. Uh, the consultation on the draft programme for government was launched on the 28th of October and will run for eight weeks until the 23rd of December. It is clear even at uh, this early stage that there continues to be strong support for the use of an outcome-based methodology in developing the programme and the opportunities it affords for collaborative working and helping to make people's lives better. It is clear that people and organisations are on board with our approach. And we are greatly encouraged by the levels of engagement from every sector. Over 800 responses were received to the earlier consultation conducted on the draft programme for government framework, almost all indicating support for the approach being taken. The programme agreed by the executive is highly cross-cutting and collaborative with joined up working across departmental boundaries and with dynamic partnerships being formed with local government, the community and voluntary sector and with the private sector. 
It is a new way of doing government, and the executive is committed to ensuring it translates into better services and better outcomes for all. We want this to be a programme for government in which everyone plays a part. People can do that right now by engaging in the consultation and by telling us about the things that matter uh, most to them and how uh, we can make them better. I call Joanne Bunting for a supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. It would appear that the uh, collaborative approach has been successful. Can I ask the Deputy First Minister to outline how he and the First Minister will continue this approach with other organisations, including the business sector? Well, I, I think the uh, extensive consultation that took place in the first stage is obviously now going to continue uh, during the course of the uh, next phase. And uh, we're very heartened by the uh, level of uh, interest and the support that there is uh, in relation to how we uh, move all of this forward. So, as I have clearly indicated, there now is a, a further public consultation uh, on the full programme for government. That's underway and will run until the 23rd of December. So, the First Minister, in my aim, is to have a final version approved by the Executive and endorsed by the Assembly after we have had the opportunity to consider the funding position around the end of the year. To that end, we, we will be engaging with as many groups and individuals as possible on the Programme for Government framework over the course of the consultation. And as with the consultation process, we want as many people as possible to have their say. So work will continue, led by senior officials in relevant departments, to identify key stakeholders and partners, and to further refine the delivery plans to help ensure we put in place the collaborative partnership and actions needed to deliver against the desired outcomes. The Executive will also shortly consult on an economic strategy, an investment strategy and a social strategy and further development of each of these will be coordinated with the programme for government and with the budget process. I call Steve Aiken for a supplementary. Thank you, uh, Deputy Madam Principal Speaker. Uh, page 25 of the platform for or programme for government makes clear that Northern Ireland goes into energy deficit by 2020. Is there any commitment for any early statement by the executive to say explicitly that the integrated single energy market is being pushed forward vigorously and that the north-south interconnector will be built? Well, of course, this is something that uh, we're uh, tremendously interested in, not just ourselves here, but obviously the government in the south as well. And uh, I suppose the member will be aware that Planning applications have been made, both uh, north and south, which are presently under consideration. So we await the outcome of that with considerable interest. Here, Sir Sean Lynch. I call Sean Lynch. Good afternoon, uh, Could the minister outline who was involved in the process to develop the framework for the PFG? Well, the, the parties to the Fresh Start Agreement last autumn agreed that a programme for government framework. Adopting uh, an outcomes-based approach will be developed. All of the parties on the previous executive were involved in a detailed process to develop the draft framework, and the parties continued to engage actively throughout the development phase until the framework was concluded after the election. None of those involved in the process expressed reservations during the engagement period. So the parties who are now expressing opposition to the draft program for government framework are either being opportunistic or did not understand the process in which they were engaged. And I think it was significant that uh, the Ulster Unionist Party chickened out of membership of the executive, left the executive, and of course the SDLP, who were part of that process of deciding on this way forward, without any objection whatsoever, then decided in the aftermath of the election that they were chicken out of the executive also. I call Paula Bradshaw. Deputy Speaker, um, can I ask the Deputy um, First Minister why there are no actual numerical targets against any of the indicators um, in this draft, and um, how credible does he feel that the programme for government is at the minute if the public are not able to measure whether progress will have been made? Well, the public have declared themselves totally satisfied in the main with our approach in relation to the outcome of the first consultation, which drew in something like 800 and 10 uh, submissions. Uh, and I think as we go forward in the second phase, obviously these are all matters that will be considered during the course of that. And then in the aftermath of that, we will uh, clearly have a further conversation about how we uh, take the, the whole process forward. So I, I am satisfied that the public uh, thus far are content. I haven't heard that criticism 
from anybody within that group of 810 that have made the uh, submissions. Quite willing to listen to what they have to say. But I think in the time ahead, there will be opportunities for people to have their say on these matters. Colin McGrath. I call Colin McGrath. Uh, question number four, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, the First Minister and I are listening carefully to the arguments in the Muller and Dos Santos application before the High Court in London and in the McCord and Agnew and others applications in Belfast. At present, however, all relevant lines of argument are being ventilated by the existing parties. Colin McGrath for a supplementary. Uh, thank you. The, the Deputy First Minister will be aware that Nicola Sturgeon has respected the majority will of the people of Scotland in supporting the legal case brought forward to the Supreme Court. Um, I think we need a wee bit more information than just another case is doing it. Why is this government question. not supporting that initiative? Well, I think in this instance it's quite clear that the member is asking a question that he knows what the answer is. And the answer is quite clearly in the run into the referendum. Uh, our partners in government were on uh, a different side of the debate from ourselves. And uh, just like the fact that the SDLP and the Ulster Unionists, who are now a combined opposition, are on opposite sides of the debate, was the Ulster Unionists' position that uh, the people have spoken, and in the context that they speak about is the UK, and that they should get on with it. So it's quite clear that the SDLP and the Ulster Unions are divided on the issue. Where the First Minister and I are united was the fact that we were able to write to the British Prime Minister outlining uh, a series of serious concerns, grave concerns that we have about the implications of Brexit in relation to how we protect the interests of the people that we represent. And I think the good news is that in the course of the North-South Ministerial Council meeting, which I will speak to when I give a report on it tomorrow in the Assembly, uh, we were able to uh, put in place a, a high-level working group of civil servants in our department, the Department of the Taoiseach and the Department of Foreign Affairs, to take forward the work that we will have to deal with in the time ahead. Uh, it's obvious to me from, from my perspective that, that we are uh, consistently getting reports out of London which are very confusing, which are confusing not just people within the political process but the general public and people in the business community. And I think it's very, very important as we go forward, for example, that the British government at least would tell the devolved institutions what their objectives are in the context of a negotiation with the European Union. Thus far, they have failed to do so. I call Christopher Stalford. Thank you, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker. Would the Deputy First Minister agree with me that it's the sign of a responsible and a mature government that regardless of whether you were for remain or for leave, you now work with the situation as you now find the member it? Come to his question. Would he also agree that that's what a responsible government should do rather than, in a similar vein, refusing to meet the, the future President of the United States of America? Well, I, I, I think uh, as, as we go forward, the, the implications of, of Brexit for all of us and for the people that we represent, whether it be the business community, the agri-food industry, the community voluntary sector, our educational institutions, places a massive responsibility on those of us who had the courage to, to go into government together to ensure that we deal with the set of circumstances which are before us. And as I've outlined during the course of my contribution to this, we did deal with it by writing to the British Prime Minister. Uh, I, I noted that the leader of the SDLP uh, this morning on Good Morning also described it as weak, uh, you know, which, which I think is absolutely ridiculous. And then I think criticised us because of the length of time it took the Prime Minister to respond. Well, that was the Prime Minister's responsibility to respond. It wasn't our responsibility. What we've been doing is getting on with the work. Uh, we have obviously given instructions to all of our departments to be up to speed in all of this in the time ahead. And of course, our contribution to the North-South Ministerial Council and the formation of a high-level uh, working group clearly shows that we're very, very active in trying to deal with a set of circumstances which denies us, for example, full information about where the negotiations are going to go if and when Article 50 of the Lisbon Treaty is triggered. Aram, sir, Philip Smith. I call Philip Smith. 
Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, what discussions has the Deputy First Minister had with the First Minister regarding the Supreme Court appeal, and are they any closer to producing uh, an agreed, joined-up post-Brexit plan for Northern Ireland? Well, I think I've outlined during the course of previous answers that the First Minister and I are very much engaged in the process of ensuring that we work with the Irish Government to protect the interests of the people, all of the people who live in this island. Uh, in terms of the, the, the court case, uh, back to my previous answer to uh, the SDLP, members ask him uh, a question that he knows the answer to. And in politics, I think that's okay because the, the DEP were on the different side of the debate in the run of the referendum. We were on the other side of the debate. That's democracy, that's politics. I have to live with that, even if I didn't appreciate it. But I have to deal with the outcome of all of that. And I think the First Minister and I have been very sensible in terms of how we're trying to deal with the situation uh, and ensuring that by working closely together through all of our departments, working with the Irish Government, that we do everything in our power to ensure that the issues that we raised during the course of the letter to the Prime Minister don't affect us negatively. Things like the border. We don't want any border between North and South. Uh, we want support for our agri-food industry. We want support for our education establishment. We want future funding for our institutions uh, and we, we clearly in terms of a common travel area when you look at the number of businesses in the north that are totally dependent upon people who have come from eastern europe to work and work very positively and productively within our businesses for example right bus uh, in, in antrim with something like over 20 percent of its workforce from eastern europe these are critical issues which we are very exercised about, and in fact, rather than sniping from the sidelines, we're actually doing something about. I call Chris Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Deputy First Minister if he agrees that a legislative consent motion should be brought to allow this Assembly the opportunity to debate and consider the terms of any Article 50 proposal? Well, well again, I, I'm speaking on behalf of the Office of First and Deputy First Minister. Well, or not the our partners in government would uh, favour that uh, is really a matter for themselves. Speaking personally and speaking on behalf of my party, not on behalf of the DEP, I would absolutely be in favour of a legislative consent motion. I call Jim Allister. The Deputy First Minister is helpless when it comes to stopping the United Kingdom leaving the EU. Could, but could I ask him straight, has he any approval from his partner in government, the DUP, for a status for Northern Ireland, which would dilute our leaving in comparison to the rest of the United Kingdom? Well, I think the entire process that we're engaged in is really in a state of flux at this stage. Nobody, me, First Minister, the member who has just spoken, or any other member of this House, can put their hand on their heart and say that they know what the final outcome of all of this would be. Uh, one thing is for sure is that we have a duty and responsibility to protect the interests of the people that we represent. And again, speaking personally, I, I would be in favour of a designated status uh, within the European Union. But well, uh, well, that's a matter for other parties. The, mem the, member, the member obviously wouldn't be in favour of that. The member obviously believes that the overall vote should take precedence over the fact that people here in the North voted to remain. The, the fact that people in Scotland voted to remain. And that does create a problem for the British government. It also creates a problem for the European Union. The fact that we have in these devolved institutions a very clearly expressed wish by the electorate that they see their future in Europe. So as far as I'm concerned in the negotiation that's upcoming, everything is on the table. Aram Sir Jennifer McCann. I call Jennifer McCann. Can I get um Kesh Devra Can I the whole question five, please? Uh, the most recent Joint Ministerial Council meeting took place on Wednesday the 9th of November and the last North-South Ministerial Council meeting took place on Friday the 18th of November 2016. At the Joint Ministerial Council meeting we outlined a number of the issues which are of particular importance to us. Uh, we made it clear that we expect to see engagement on these and other matters intensify and deepen over the coming weeks and that we are determined to work together to champion the interests of the people we represent. We had a, a very good meeting with the Irish Government on Friday at the North-South Ministerial Council Plenary in Armagh, uh, and I will be making a detailed Assembly statement tomorrow morning, Tuesday the 22nd of November, on our discussions. 
Ministers have also had discussions at various NSMC sectoral meetings that have taken place in recent weeks and months, and that engagement is ongoing. Indeed, both governments have agreed that the North-South Ministerial Council plenary should meet again in the first quarter of 2017. In the light of the uh, UK referendum to leave the EU, the focus for executive ministers throughout all these discussions has been to ensure that our unique position is recognised and our requirements are understood and how we can ensure the best possible outcome for all of our people. Jennifer McCann for a supplementary. Uh, can I thank the Minister for his answer? And I know you've already mentioned about uh, the different engagements, but can you sort of uh, elaborate on what um, engagement has taken place with the Irish government, particularly to identify issues of mutual interest and to also exert joint influence on the British government and the EU? Well, the, the, there is, as I said earlier, ongoing engagement between officials up to the head of the civil service level. And specifically, we are engaging with the Irish government through the North South Ministerial Council and the respective administrations have been carrying out an audit of border issues. This was discussed at the plenary meeting last Friday, uh, the 18th of November, and we will also engage further in Brexit via the British Irish Council and the next uh, big meeting is scheduled for uh, next uh, week in Cardiff. Call Sandra Overin. Well, Deputy Speaker, can the Deputy First Minister uh, explain what is, this, is his assessment of the approaches of the different devolved administrations in Belfast, Cardiff and Edinburgh? Well, it's, it's not my duty and responsibility to speak on behalf of Scotland and, uh, and Wales. Uh, I only have authority to speak on uh, our own behalf. There are other factors at play, particularly in relation to Scotland, which I'm sure the member is uh, very acutely aware of. Uh, no doubt the First Minister and I will have further conversations with our ministerial colleagues uh, during the course of the next big meeting. I think I said earlier it was next week. In fact, it is the end of this week. So I think that uh, in, in all of those discussions, we're, we're all very conscious of the responsibility that devolved institutions have to, to the people that they represent. Uh, in Wales, the people of Wales uh, voted to, to leave. Uh, in Scotland, the people of Scotland voted to remain. People here voted to remain. Uh, and of course, the, the people in England voted to leave also. So that does leave us with a, a very challenging situation to deal with. And uh, no doubt, you know, the reports that are coming out of London almost on a daily basis about the uh, appeared inability thus far of the British government to have a collective view as to how to approach these negotiations is also exercising the devolved institutions. I call Stephen Farry. Uh, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker, both the Deputy First Minister and I agree on the need for special status uh, for Northern Ireland. But would he also recognise that if this is to get traction with the whole community, including uh, with unionists, that this has to be sold in very pragmatic terms around the interests of Northern Ireland and therefore be decoupled from wider constitutional aspirations and also the issue of a border poll? Well, I, I, I think obviously the, the, the situation that, that, that we're dealing with is, is hugely challenging. Of that, there can be no doubt whatsoever. In terms of the uh, constitutional position. Th this really revolves around the uh, reality that we have a, a scenario where we've just been through a referendum which has in, in some sense decided the direction of travel for this British government, a situation that we have to deal with. As I said in my earlier answer to the member for North Antrim, uh, as far as I'm concerned, everything is on the table. Nobody knows, nobody can put their hand on their heart and say exactly how this negotiation is going to work itself out or where we're going to find ourselves, uh, whether it be in a year's time or two years' time during the course of any negotiation. All of the reports out of Europe clearly suggest, which seems to be accepted by a lot of commentators and indeed many within the political process in London, that this looks like it's going to be a hard Brexit. If it is a hard Brexit, it's going to have, I think, very dramatic repercussions for devolved institutions, and particularly ourselves, who are in this unique position of, of having a land border with a country that is in Europe. So I think in the time ahead, in the discussions that we will, will see happen between our officials, but also between the First Minister, myself, and the Taoiseach, 
I think the, the best way forward for us is to work very closely together so that we can reach an outcome which can then be put to both the British government and to the European Union as the combined wisdom of uh, both governments, north and south. So top priority for us is protecting the interests of the people that we represent. And I, I'm basically talking about the, the people that every single member of this House represents. And that ends the period for listed questions. We will now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. Aram Sir, Justin McNulty. I call Justin McNulty. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, <clears throat> can I ask the, first, the Deputy First Minister, does he stand by his call on the Charter NI CEO to stand down? Well, uh, uh, I uh, think all of this is a, a very unfortunate situation because the, the difficulty about where we find ourselves is that a fantastic programme, the SIF programme, which will bring enormous benefits to uh, people all over the north in terms of uh, getting young people into employment, preparing the pathway for them, supporting families, supporting uh, educational uh, initiatives, and indeed uh, many other initiatives which uh, are born from the desire of local communities who make the decision as to what projects they want pursued. Uh, the fact that we've had this debate over the course of the last uh, couple of weeks is very unhelpful indeed. And uh, I was at uh, Alton Galvin Hospital this morning with the, our health minister looking at the new radiotherapy unit and I was asked by the BBC in the aftermath of that visit uh, what my position was in relation to our speaker. And I was able to tell him that I knew that our speaker would make a statement at uh, 12 o'clock and the speaker has made the, the statement and I accept the speaker's statement. In relation to the situation with Charter NI, uh, I, I do stand by my remarks that uh, DSTIT should uh, recognise the damage that has been done to uh, Charter NI, the damage that has been done to the local community in East Belfast, and, and that he should stand aside. I don't believe for one minute he will do it as a result of me saying it, but I do think there is a responsibility on him to sit back and recognise uh, the damage that has been done to an organisation that he's part of. But he also should think of the bigger picture. And I know that in the steering groups and the different uh, initiatives that have been taken all over the north, Can I there's considerable the concern now, to bring his if we just finish with this point, considerable concern among many of these groups that their funding could be uh, frozen. And I think that's uh, very, very sad. Of course, it won't be frozen, but that's a big difficulty. I call Justin McNulty for supplement. Has the Deputy First Minister discussed this issue with the First Minister and what action will the, will the Executive take if Mr Stitt continues in position? I have discussed this issue with the First Minister. Uh, our ability to take action in relation to uh, Charter NI is, uh, I think, very limited indeed under employment law. But I do reiterate the point I made earlier. I think the best outcome uh, in the period ahead uh, would be for the person in question to recognise that uh, his contribution to all of this in the time ahead is a negative one and not in the interest of Charter NI or the people of East Belfast or indeed all of the other many, many groups throughout the North who are working away on tremendous projects, delivering tremendous projects for local communities. Here is our Declan Kearney. I call Declan Kearney. Gorakiad Maigat, Alias, Freef Kyung Kyorliagas Mawea has done Alias Kiadara. Thank you, Speaker, Deputy uh, Speaker, and uh, thank you, DFM. Twelve months on from the Fresh Start Agreement, does the Deputy First Minister agree with me that all political parties and all sections of society have a, an incredibly important role to play in the development and promotion of reconciliation and healing? I absolutely do, do agree with the member. I think 12 uh, months on from the signing of the Fresh Start Agreement, it, it is incumbent upon all of us, every political party, community and voluntary sector, everybody in a position of influence within the community, to uh, recognise the, the importance of uh, 
the whole process of reconciliation. And I've been on the record quite a number of times in the course of recent months as stating my view that the next stage of our process has to be a, a process of uh, reconciliation. Uh, I think there's tremendous work taking place within uh, the community, but, but I do think people in leadership positions have also got a huge responsibility to challenge themselves as to whether or not enough has been done to inspire more and more people within local communi communities to recognise uh, the importance of reconciliation. I also say that knowing that, uh, you know, that there are people in our society who are not interested in being uh, reconciled, but I think they're very much a minority. I think the overwhelming mood of our people is for uh, the continuation of what is a successful peace process into a phase of reconciliation. And I have no doubt whatsoever, given the right leadership, that more and more people will rally to that flag. Declan Kearney, La Cache de Brescia. Declan Kearney for supplementary questions. Gormaigat Asoktan Fragrishan alias Hiadara. Minister, would you agree that uh, the reconciliation and healing agenda must be placed at the heart of government and public policy, both within this region and in the context of the all island institutions? Yeah, I, I absolutely do agree. I think that it is uh, critically important that we here in these institutions play our full part and showing leadership to people in the community as to uh, what is the, uh, undoubtedly the best way forward. I mean, this, this is a process that has inspired uh, the ending of conflicts in other parts of the world. Uh, we've, we've recently had a visit from the Colombian uh, President Santos, who came here and told the BBC and others, uh, anyone that was interested in his story, that he was inspired by the peace process here. Uh, I think that's a credit to everybody that contributed to that process, and in my view, every single party in this House. But we need to go further. We need to recognise that there are uh, still challenges that lie ahead, uh, not least in how we, uh, on an ongoing basis, reconcile uh, what was for a very long time a very divided community. M my party is certainly up for that, and I believe that it it's incumbent upon all of us to consistently challenge yourself. I've, I have, you know, went, went out very, very far in relation to challenging Republicans, I suppose, in terms of our contribution to reconciliation. Some people don't like what I've done, and, and I respect their view, but some of the arguments that are put to me is that, you know, I, I shouldn't do it because there's no reciprocation. Well, my answer back is that that's not a good reason for me to stop. If you're genuine and sincere about reconciliation, you have to do everything in your power to make it work. And I do that working on the basis that eventually we will get it right. I call Roy Beggs for a topical question. With, with regard to Charter NI, the Deputy First Minister indicated that benefits uh, can result from the employability scheme. And I, I agree. But would the Deputy First Minister accept that when there are multiple layers and large amount of administration costs, that fewer people on the ground will benefit? Well, you know, I think the member will be aware that whenever we went out to consultation at the very beginning of all of this, this, this is one of the most consulted programs that we were ever involved in. It was a very open, very transparent process. And of course, the, the whole purpose of the uh, SIF project was to ensure that we would have not, not a top-down approach, but a, a bottom-up approach, where this was people empowering people in local communities to decide for themselves what local communities required as a priority in their particular areas. And obviously, putting in place uh, a, a process like that uh, does incur costs. Uh, absolutely, it's absolutely unavoidable if they're to be conducted properly. And I think that our civil servants have been very meticulous, even to the point of some criticism from, from some that uh, it has taken too long to put this in place. Well, we're now at a position where the £80 million pound has been effectively allocated in relation to the projects. And I think as we go forward, uh, we can consistently ask ourselves, you know, are there ways that we could have improved that during the course of what was uh, a pilot scheme, for want of a better word? Roy Beggs for supplementary. The Deputy First Minister has alluded to the 
uh, many, many years that it's taken for this funding to reach the ground. And he's again saying it's, it's important to get things right. This is a la language we've heard before. Can the member but would, come to would, his would he accept? Would he accept? that this process has been fatally flawed, that there is inappropriate processes and a lack of accountability of the decision makings that went along with it? No, no I, I wouldn't accept that it was fatally flawed at all. And in fact, pr practically every party in this assembly, including the members, have been involved in the process from the very beginning. And it, it was quite interesting, even though people have now seized on uh, what is a, a very sad situation in relation to East Belfast, uh, I've now seized on that in an effort to criticise the overall SIF programme. Yet, whenever the First Minister and Junior Minister Farron went to Enniskillen last week for the opening of a £900,000 investment from the SIF fund, the Ulster Unionist Party and the SDLP were tripping over themselves to get into the photographs. Yeah. <laughs> I call Maris Bradley. Deputy Principal Speaker. Uh, can I ask the First Minister, Deputy First Minister, uh, last week technology giant Google delivered a vote of confidence in the UK as a technological hub by announcing plans for a new building in London. Does the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister envisage any spin-off by the company here in Northern Ireland, given that we have the Project Kelvin interconnector, the most secure connection between Europe and America, based in Korean? Yeah. Well, I mean, this, this is uh, obviously something that... Uh, that we are very keen to see develop, and Project Kelvin uh, is doing a tremendous work. But in, in all of our engagements, and the First Minister recently was in uh, the United States, I, I followed her visit with a visit of my own to uh, the west coast of the United States and met with our west coast advisory group, uh, who, who are a tremendous group of people based in Silicon Valley. So we're continually uh, seeking to ensure that we can attract foreign direct investment, which will benefit us in relation to the new digital age that we live in. So it's an ongoing body of work for us, for our Bureau in Washington, for InvestNI, and we are very focused on trying to ensure that whenever opportunities are created that we can take advantage of them. Maris Bradley for supplementary. Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank, and I thank the uh, Deputy First Minister for that answer. Can I ask the Deputy First Minister, Minister uh, given the connection that we have in Korean and the opportunity to sell Northern Ireland PLC uh, across the IT sector, I would be hopeful that Korean could play a role in adding to this sector and attract much needed investment into the area. Are you aware of any firms interested in investing in the Korean project? Well, I, I'm also you know, very conscious of uh, what potentially is... Uh, a huge development situation at Ballykelly, which I think will bring enormous benefits to people in the northwest, including Coleraine, Limavady, and my own city of Derry. Uh, I, w I was there recently speaking to the purchasers of the site. They have huge plans for the site, and uh, I'm very encouraged by what I am hearing. Obviously, we are consistently, through uh, trying to attract foreign direct investment, uh, focusing on an aspect of work that the First Minister and I are agreed on, and that is to ensure that uh, you know, companies that are interested in coming here uh, recognise that there is a, a big world outside of Belfast, including in the, in the North West. Uh, and we're, we're publicly on the record as having stated that, and in terms of putting together our programme for government, uh, that will very much be a focus of our uh, programme for government in the time ahead in terms of uh, the whole issue of decentralisation. The other aspect of Ballykelly is obviously the fact that we will have for the first time in the history of the state, uh, a department, the era, uh, effectively located uh, outside of Belfast on the Ballykelly site, which in itself will, I think, bring further encouragement uh, to people in the area that we are putting a focus on the need for decentralisation. Here, Sir Sean Lynch. Graham, I'll get uh, uh, pre and ask and call you. And as my question also involves uh, social investment fund, I want to declare an interest as a member of the Western uh, Steering Group. Can the minister give a reassurance that the social investment fund is delivered for communities as intended? Well, I, I don't have any shadow of a doubt whatsoever that the uh, projects that have been undertaken by the steering groups and by local communities will make a, a massive difference and the whole uh, effort to tackle underachievement 
and disadvantage and marginalisation. And I think whenever we visit the projects, as we have done during the course of recent times with the First Minister in Fermanagh last week for a fantastic uh, unveiling of the uh, new extension to Fermanagh House, or, or myself going to different parts of the north, speaking to people who are very focused on employability, getting young people into a pathway to employment. Uh, and we're not talking about you know, a couple of dozen, we're talking about hundreds of people who are involved in these projects all over the north. I think it's quite clear that the SIF Fund is making a massive contribution to tackle underachievement. And the beauty of it is it's not us telling the local communities how they should go about choosing their projects. These are the local communities choosing the projects for themselves. And I again reiterate the point, even in the face of some of the opportunistic criticism that has come in the course of recent times, all of the major parties in this assembly have been represented on these steering groups. And it's uh, quite ironic that now in the aftermath of the controversy around East Belfast, that people are using it to take pot shots at people who are doing great work all over the North. I think, I think that's very, very unfair. Unfortunately, there isn't time for a supplementary. The time is up. We must